The Australian Financial Review. Hello, ho, ho. I'm James Thompson, Senior Chanticleer Columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. With me today, as always, is my Chanticleer colleague, the Santa of the Stock Exchange. It's Anthony McDonald. Anthony, how are you? Ah, oh, James, you've completely outdone me with that. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Well, this week we wrap up 2023 by presenting our special Chanticleer podcast awards. We examine what's ahead for markets in 2024 with our special guest, fund manager Catherine Orfrey. And we help readers out with last-minute Christmas shopping. Well, Anthony, we've made it. Mm. It's been an incredibly long and dramatic year. Big deals that didn't get there, the collapse of several banks in March, turmoil on the markets, war in the Middle East. But the chooks are still standing, and believe it or not, equity markets are within a whisker of their all-time highs. Anthony, can you quite believe that we're done for the year? I can actually. (laughs) (laughs) A lot has happened this year. Like indeed, as a lot happens every year. And from yeah, from a story perspective, it was Sun Cable at the start of the year, PwC, Qantas, Origin Takeover, Chemist Warehouse deal. There's been a bit of everything on the corporate side, but it's probably been the markets that have been the story of the year. Yeah, the rise of the inflation, the interest rates, unemployment staying low. The US will it go into a recession? Will it not? Can you have a full employment recession? But then we've also had Philip Lowe during the year. Yeah. We've had Gina Cascott leave from the ACCC come in and throw some haymakers. Um, so there's been a bit of everything this year and we're sitting here, iron ores, US $140 a ton nearly. Yeah. So that's keeping Australia afloat. Um, so yeah, I think it's been a fantastic year. Oh, it's been a great year for, great year for uh, uh, columnists. I, 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 I sometimes feel for the investors out there who've had to withstand all this. I mean, the, the laundry list you just reeled off is... Amazing. And you're right. Stuff happens every year, but like this one just feels like we've been gyrating um, all all the time. But as you say, it's great for, great, great for the Chanticleer podcast. Yeah. It was just the variety. Yeah. We just had, we had everything. We had, you know, like Qantas record profit, yet Qantas sort of completely pulled apart by its customers. You know, it, it was just a year of a bit of the lot. And, and a few stories, as we've said a few times that went from the pages of the Financial mm. Review to the mainstream media, Qantas and PwC and Optus. And it's such so, such great fun when that happens. It just ups the stakes for everything. Um, as I said before, Anthony, we've got a special guest who will join us after the break to discuss the year ahead. And she's even going to give us a few stock tips. But before we get there, we wanted to wrap up the year in business with a very special set of awards. Over to you, Anthony, to open the first envelope. Okay, James, first one. The Excellence in Business Award, a CEO who got his or her business firing this year. Okay, I'm going to go first. I am going to uh, call on the spirit of Tony Boyd, the uh, the great <laughs> chook who retired this year, another big news event, and give my Excellence in Business Award to Sachin Adela of Microsoft. Okay. Perfectly ridden the, the AI boom from the start of the year when he did his big deal with uh, OpenAI just after they'd released um, ChatGPT. And then we get to the end of the year and he's the guy who saves Sam Altman from this bizarre sacking. He's the guy who stitches it all back together, reconstitutes the board at OpenAI and Microsoft's position, if anything, looks even stronger. I mean... Sachin Adela has done a great job at Microsoft turning this place around over a decade, but this year he's just fancy footwork to keep at the front of this AI craze. Very impressive. Great pick. Big, global, you know, you've got the top, probably the top one in the world there. Yes, um, maybe. Unfortunately, as we know, I'm a little bit smaller thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm just playing in Australia and I've gone with Vic Bansell, the CEO of Borrell, who sell construction materials in Australia. I, th- I think he's just done a, a great job at doing what was needed, all right? So Borrell just lost its way. It went over to the US, got distracted. It wasn't running its Australian business hard enough. So the US is now gone. The seven groups in control, the Stokeses, mm. they brought in Vic Bansell. And it seems from my dealings with him, he's just gone back to focusing on the basics. Yep. He's just trying to get it leaner, meaner. 
He's done fantastically well at pushing through price increases. He's, I mean, he's had a bit of cost increase in his business as well, but he's pushed up prices more than the cost. You know, he's thinking about AI. He's opened, he's going bigger in Queensland ahead of the Olympics up there. He's done, he's done well. Yeah. And, and you like to say this about Vic and I think the, the also, credit also goes to Ryan Stokes who mm. hired him and his pushes so hard, this owner's mindset, investors love it. And it, typically pays dividends. People treat the company as though it's their own. They're incentivized to do that and it works. Yeah. And I I love how he strips it down. And it's got me thinking much differently about businesses when I interview CEOs. It's all just cost, price, and volume. They're the the only three levers a CEO's got. So it's just like, how do you shift those three around? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Anthony, on to our next award. And this is the put a wing on it award for a CEO or company to watch next year. Anthony, who's your uh, who's your prize winner here? I've gone for something a little bit off the radar, mm. and that's Guzman and Gomez. Ooh. You know the burrito chain. Yes. So they're they're sort of uh, talking about a big float next year. So they last raised money, they got a one point three five billion dollar valuation, and they want a float next year. You'd assume it's going to be at more than that. They've got some big shareholders who have stars in their eyes and think this thing's worth a lot. Mm-hmm. Now I saw the C, the co-CEO, Stephen Marks, who's also the founder, he pitched at the Sone Hearts and Mind conference about yep. a month ago. Yep. And it was a fantastic pitch. Oh. It was like fast, exciting, 10 minutes. He had everyone eating out of his hand. Mm. But you know, it was all very marketing as well. There was no, there's no time for anyone to ask questions or, or really think about what he's saying, but he just presented really well. Now, for some reason though, GYG's it's got some doubters out there, mm. all right? So it's, it's going to be floating into some headwinds and some sort of skepticism about its business. Um, they obviously think it's great. It's growing like a weed. But it's going to be really, really fascinating to see whether they can um, get this float through, I think. Okay. okay. What about you? Uh, I'm going to go with Robin Cuda of Airtrunk. Um, Airtrunk is the big uh, data center business, homegrown, um, backed by Macquarie now. Again, another business that's looking at a float next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, quietly did the biggest debt deal in the Australian market this year. I think it was 4.6 billion, 40 banks got involved. People just love this thing. Um, and I think this, this business has been growing nicely. Robin Cooter came to our property summit and I remember him saying, you know, we were growing along and then the demand from AI is just so big that we're having to rethink the way we think about these big data centers. So this could be a cracking float. I know we're, both of us nominated floats yeah. after a year of two years of no floats. Yeah. So uh, I reckon Robin's one to watch. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that one will also be interesting because it's like, it's almost like the smart money got in there. Like Goldman yeah, Sachs had true. it, then Macquarie. True. You imagine next step's going to be some pension funds rolling in Yeah, and it'd just be interesting to see like the evolution of a, of a business and its uh, ownership structure. Yeah. Um, all right, James, next one, we've got the sunny side up award for the feel good story of the year. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going a bit off, uh, off the beaten path here too. You remember Lion Town Resources, the lithium miner yep. hasn't been a great year for lithium miners and it's been a pretty weird year for Lion Town. They had a big takeover deal on the hook from a company called Albemarle, uh, enter Gina Reinhart, who bought 19.9% of the company and effectively blocked the deal. So ostensibly they're a loser, but I, I reckon I was impressed by Tony Ottaviano, the CEO who pivoted from that and got a debt deal, raised a billion dollars to get his mine, this Kathleen Valley mine that they own, to get it over the line, to get it completed. And, you know, there's some, it's under construction. Now they're building 200 meter tall wind towers out wow. there to power the thing. So look, I think it's a great example of sort of snatching a bit of a, a small victory, not the great victory they thought they had, but snatching a victory from the jaws of defeat. So I reckon good, good on them and, and, and good luck. I mean, the, the lithium price is in the toilet, so oh, yeah. they need all the luck they can get. But I think we want businesses like Lion Town to succeed in Australia. It's good for the country to get the next mining sector going. Yeah, definitely. Well, my feel good story of the year. Um, it's got to be the Walkley, doesn't it, James? <laughs> Three of my four Chanticleer podcast members, yourself and our producers, Lap Fan and Alex Gow, picking up the Walkley for some of the PwC coverage. <laughs> oh, I thought that, that was fantastic. Very cool um, <laughs> But I'll go, with, I'll go with Chemist Warehouse, and perhaps I'm suffering from a little recency bias here because it has only just happened in the past few weeks. But if you stand back and think, 
all right, what is the ASX for? Yep. You know, it's about the allocation of capital, sort of recycling capital, recycling ownership, hopefully setting things up for the long term. I mean, this is a big moment. I mean, it's it's obviously a great business, big Australian business, done really well, 600 stores, huge footprint, you know, nearly $10 billion in sort of network sales. And I mean, I'm not, this doesn't necessarily mean that Sigma shares are a good buy because it's buying Chemist Warehouse or anything like that. But I just think if you, if you think about what the ASX is for, yep. Um, this deal really reaffirms the value of public markets. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing with Chemist Warehouse, and, and you know, I'm a former Rich List editor, but the Rich List is full of great Australian success stories from people of all walks of life. Yeah, there are lots of people who've inherited mum or dad's money. That, that's great. But there's lots of people who've come from bizarre circumstances the, the wrong side of the tracks, the, you know, over, lots of people from overseas. And this is another example of a business where a, a bunch, two, two big families sort of had a crack and did something that no other big corporate in Australia could do. So I, I agree. We've got to celebrate that sort of stuff. All right. Our next award is the Rooster Booster Award for a CEO or company who delivered a 20 kilo pile of crap. Yeah. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, there's... There's actually a lot of contenders this year. Yes. There's been some real dirtbags out there. Um, I'm going with Star Entertainment Group, though, the casino owner. Um, you know, we thought this was going to be the year of the rebuild. I mean, it had a new board, new management team, post clean out, regulatory issues looked like they'd settled down. You know, all that was supposed to be in the past. Instead, though, this has been the year of the reckoning. I mean, this has been the year where financially all that stuff's caught up with it. Yeah. Yep. Um, it almost went broke twice. Yeah. It had to be bailed out by shareholders twice. Uh, the first time was in February. It was a surprise. We all th- and then we all thought it had its covenants covered and, and was out of the woods. It said it had got enough money for three years. Exactly. <laughs> Six months later, though, it had to do it all again because it was under pressure from its banks. So I know they said they considered other strategic options, but to almost go broke twice in the space of six or eight months, uh, let alone in the space of a year, that's, that's new territory. And then, I mean, you think about the fact that it's still not really running its own casinos. Its earnings are still not going in the direction shareholders would like them to. It's got three times as many shares on issue. It's such a long road back. Yeah. I, I often hear um, people suggest that there's no accountability in Australian business. I'd suggest people look to the casino sector, you know, string of royal commissions and inquiries. And that sector is a shell of itself, absolute shell of itself. All right. My rooster booster, there's only one. It's Qantas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you said it before. It's amazing that a company can post a record profit and then within weeks just be in crisis, a crisis that claims its CEO early and its chairman. But they've just failed to read the market failed to get the balance right between shareholders and staff and customers. I mean, I think that's really at the heart of it. They've been taken to the high court or they've gone to the high court and only to be found that they'd sacked uh, a bunch of workers illegally. The ACCC's taken them to the federal court over the you know these alleged ghost flights. And we should say that uh, Qantas is very much defending itself on that case. Everybody has had a bad experience with Qantas. And yes, that happens. It's, it's a small market and they're a dominant player, but it just didn't listen to anyone outside uh, the business until it was too late. And, you know, it's just been a, a, a shocker. Uh, I, I, they'll, they'll be doing business school case studies of this for decades, I reckon. Yeah, that is a big bag of rooster booster. <laughs> um, next award, James, the Rotten Egg Award for the stinkiest deal. Uh, I think Aurora is a packaging oh, yeah. company we haven't talked about a lot. Um, they bought a they they bought a French uh, bottle maker, that, mm-hmm. a, a maker of specialist bottles, so fancy whiskey bottles and that sort of thing. I've never seen a deal that everybody hated from the moment it was announced. Mm. Like it, it, they managed to raise the money eventually that they required to do the deal, but you look back at it and you think, "Geez, they were lucky to get this away." Um, we've since had a, a, a profit update, a trading update about this very business, and it already seems to be underperforming the market's expectations. Um, it's just a startling deal that everybody sort of knew it was coming. Everybody knew it was going to be bad, and that's exactly what's happened. I mean, you get divided opinions on a deal, but this was – I can't believe how quickly it was written off, and it's proved to be correct. Yeah, it was like a stable Australian company that was just – 
sticking to its knitting, doing the right thing, apparently focused on Australian cans as the sort of growth option. And then it's gone overseas with a massive acquisition, yeah. buying off private equity, French business, in these special new yeah tequila bottles and stuff. Yeah, with a big equity raising attached. Um, no, I, I agree with you. That that one is uh, you're our deal specialist. You must a, have a lot of contenders. That's here, a rotten egg. There's so many contenders here. Um, Perpetual buying Pendle, so that's one fan, fund manager buying its big rival. Another at completely the wrong time, in outflows now, and having to consider other strategic options. There was also the Battery Minerals Group, uh, IGO, buying Western Areas, a nickel company. That happened. That happened last year, but it's since had to write down a billion dollars, and it's it's been a real disaster. IGO, which is um, lithium nickel miner, buying Western Areas. That happened last year too, but it's pretty much written the whole value of that off yep. over a billion dollars. My one though, and it's it's a little bit unusual, but it was stinky. <laughs> um, was uh, so there's a petrol station group called Viva Energy, and it's got a big shareholder called Vitol, which is a uh, sort of a trading house. Now, Vitol decided that it wanted to try and sell part of its stake in Viva Energy. This, the story leaked, though, and Viva Energy shares tanked. Yep. And the trade never happened. Mm. And it was really, really, really smelly. But anyway, that night, then Vitol went in and they, they, sold, they sold the stock. It was at a bit, big discount. But meanwhile, people have been shorting it and made money. But it was just really stinky the way it got out. Yeah. It, it raised some serious questions about the integrity of Australian capital markets. Mm. And... So yeah, I think just in pure smell, I thought that one smelt the worst. And is there more to come from ASIC or something like that? Or? I mean, you would have thought so, but it kind of, it's just one of those ones that just sort of gets lost in the mix, you know, it just, everyone goes, jumps onto the next thing. Yeah. All right. Our final award, Anthony, is the Easter Egg in Summer Award for the CEO or company that melted under a bit of pressure. I'm in two minds on this one, but I think I'll go with Albemarle. Okay. At Liontown. Right, so yeah. it it got in there, did its DD. It'd been working on DD for weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks. We should say DD is due diligence. Due diligence, <laughs> sorry, yeah. It got in, did due diligence, saw the books. Apparently, really liked it. Yep. But in the background, Gina Reinhart was buying up a stake, so she ended up buying uh, close to twenty percent. Now, instead of trying to structure the deal or do anything else, it just walked away. Mm. And now I just kind of wonder. Did it just melt in the sun? Like, did, should it have tried something else? Yeah. Because this was Lion Town, as we remember, like you, you spoke about it just before, like it needed funding at the time. Like it couldn't afford to have a suitor just walk away. Yeah. Kind of wonder whether it missed a chance to do something else there, get in in some other way. I mean, I, I wonder whether it, it spoke to Gina Reinhardt and Hancock about it. I wonder whether, yeah, there was some other structure it could have come up with. Or perhaps it just saw something in the data room that it didn't like. Mm. So either way, it feels to me like they melted a bit on that one. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think my uh, melting moment um, was when the then chief executive of PwC, oh, yeah. Tom Seymour, uh, melted live on stage at the <laughs> Business Summit, um, the Australian Financial Review's Business Summit, and he described this. At that stage, they were just sort of rumours or – a bit of speculation about the size of this tax scandal. And Tom decided to describe it as a perception problem. Mm. It's not you. It's, it's, it's not us. It's you who have the uh, wrong view of this. Um, and in doing so, I think th that was a bit of a brain meltdown because it put a big target on PwC's back. A and that led to the, the revelations really because – so many people came to Neil Chenoweth and Ed Tadros, the gun reporters at the Finn who broke that story and said, no, 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 this isn't a perception mm -hmm. problem. This is real. And think about how that snowballed. Mm. You go from that moment where it's a perception problem, there's a few rotten, rotten apples in the barrel, to a few months later, PwC sells its government consulting business for a dollar. 20% of its business for a dollar. <laughs> for a dollar. Yeah. I mean, it is just an incredible uh, unraveling, yeah. I, I guess. So um, that's probably not one Easter egg melting. That's the whole uh, Easter <laughs> basket melting. But um, I just, I, I look back at that story and think, wow, it, it's amazing how a company or a, a firm can, you know, seem so, start the year in such a seemingly strong position and end it in this sort of terribly weakened position. And with, as you say, with 20% of its business gone. So 
It's yeah, it, it's funny. That one took a long time. Like it took obviously it took was it six years or something for the, for it to come out what had happened. But once it was out, it escalated quickly and unraveled fast. Yeah, yeah. Well, Anthony, I'm not sure we give our congratulations to the award <laughs> yeah. winners, but uh, we thank them for giving us plenty of fodder to talk and write about this year. We'll come back after the break with our special guest to have a look at markets in 2024. Welcome back. If you want to know more about what we're talking about today and a whole lot more, AFR subscribers can sign up to the Chanticleer newsletter at join.afr.com forward slash Chanticleer. Every Friday, the newsletter pulls together the best Chanticleer columns from the week and the best bits of this podcast and delivers them straight to your inbox. Well, Anthony, we've been lucky to have some great guests on the Chanticleer podcast this year, but I reckon we've saved the best until last year. Here to look ahead to 2024 on financial markets and maybe even help us with a few stocks we should be thinking about over the summer break. We are thrilled to welcome Catherine Alfrey, the Portfolio Manager at Wavestone Capital. Hi, Catherine. Hi, James. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Catherine, it's been some sort of year on markets. Who would have thought we'd be sitting here with markets not far off all-time highs despite Credit Suisse going down in March? What have been the big themes for you this year? Well, I think we started the year, didn't we, with a recession. Mm. People thought that the US was going to go into recession uh, and it was all about we've had the fastest increase in interest rates. We've had this huge backup in, you know, yields. Mm. And so people were really, you know, worried and obviously scared. And even with the China, if you go back this time last year, the China recovery, October, November was just full string. You know, we all thought that China was going to take off in 23. And in fact, we've had the opposite. We've had this... (laughs) amazing resilient consumer, both here and in the US. And that's because savings ratio has been so high, um, both here and in the US, but also fiscal policy, particularly in the US, um, that has been a major difference. And I think, you know, going over and visiting the US in sort of March and then again in um, one of my colleagues in June, it was very obvious that the US was just pumping. And despite those rate increases, he was going to have to go harder. And that's really what transpired. Yeah, we're often talking about the mood of investors on this Chanticleer podcast and what we detect is some scepticism or caution towards deal-making by companies this year. I mean, do you think that's fair? Well, of course, what you're going to do is in a rising rate environment, you're going to get this Mexican standoff, really, Mm. um, because the bid-ask spread is too wide. Yep. Uh, and so what we need is a period of, you know, stable rates where how we can price deals. And at the moment, you know, that's what this, this year as it's transpired, unfortunately, we haven't had that. We've just had this rising rate environment. Now things are settling down. And I think it's just interesting that if you look at stocks like Macquarie, for example, who, you know, that's their income comes from a lot of asset realisation activity work, then hopefully in 24, you'll see that come through now. Uh, and I would anticipate that it's going to be a lot better in 24 for deals to get done. But we, we've seen, Catherine, the IPO window largely shut in 2023 and even in mostly in 2022. Does that reflect, you know, uh, a certain view from uh, investors that they're just not sure about the stuff that's being pitched to them? Or does it reflect, you know, that sense of, I might like that idea of that, that potential IPO, but I'm just not sure how to price it because I don't know where rates are going to be sitting. It's also scepticism about... Who is the seller? Yes. Right? <laughs> yep. And, you know, fair enough, a lot of it's private equity firms and they've also got clients and they expect to maximise their sale price. So whereas 20 years ago, a lot of it was founder-led, a lot of it was sold at a reasonable discount, you bought into an IPO and then therefore, you know, away you went with that IPO and you backed it. Now it's perfectly priced mm. and it usually comes with a few bombs attached. Right. And so we always say to our analysts, come on, let's work out where are the bombs here because over the next two to three years, we need to be sure that the earnings are going to be delivered mm. to justify the valuation we have to pay for this IPO. So to be honest, there's too many scars and so we sort of you know back back and yep. just say, no, unless it's really good, we're not going to buy it. Yes, yes. All right, well, give us a sense. What what the, the Best and the worst of the year. What, is there a great deal or a winner that you've really enjoyed writing this year? 
Oh, that's a hard one um, <laughs> because there really haven't been that many deals that I would say have been fantastic um, and that we've been, I guess, on the right side of. Like uh, one car, you know, car group, as they call it now, um, has done a good job in terms of, you know, buying Trader Interactive and then Web Motors. And we're, so we've backed that one and that's yep. done very well for us over the last 18 months. Um, conversely, I'm a bit disappointed with Treasury Wine and okay. that. We are long that stock and, uh, you know, they bought uh, US acquisition, paid a pretty big price for it and they also bought it at the time when the Aussie dollar was 63 cents. So that's a bit sceptical, but I get what they were doing. You know, it's all about premiumization of wine and so that business is um, within their strategy, but that was one where we thought was a full price. Uh, We weren't on the new crest, you you know, unfortunately that uh, ticket in terms of takeover. Yeah. and then I'd have to have, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the Santos Woodside deal comes through. Yeah. That comes through. A- any early thoughts? I think Santos is undervalued. Uh, and so, you know, Woodside has got to pay a premium. Mm-hmm. Um, the question is what that premium is. Uh, it makes sense. I mean, all the global fossil fuel players seem to be scaling up, right, to attack this whole change uh, in energy transition that is occurring over the, you know, obviously the t- our lifetimes. Uh, and so it makes sense from Australia to have an Australian champion, but the question is what the price is. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Can I ask you, are you a very public about your scepticism about ANZ's takeover <laughs> of Suncorp's banking division? Yeah. So this is starting to become like a bit like Origin Energy, the deal that never dies. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're, we've been to the competition tribunal I imagine you would have probably hoped ANZ would have walked away or found a reason to walk away yeah. by now. Are you still yeah. sceptical? Yeah, we're, we're just sceptical on the price that they were going to pay or are going, intending to pay yeah. for it. Uh, and we just think it's far too high. And you've seen what's happened in banking in the last 12 months in terms of margins coming down significantly, competition increasing significantly in mortgages uh, and in deposits. And so therefore returns in the retail banking part of the market have fallen significantly. And so I get that banking is a scale game going forward. And you can see that in terms of financial crimes and the cost of you know technology that they're having to spend. Yep. Um, but the price that ANZ is paying is too much. Can you just go back to Treasury Wine Estates for a second? And obviously you said you've, you owned it and this is a company doing a pretty big transaction, raising equity to fund it. You're a little bit iffy on the price, a little bit iffy on the target. Mm. What do you do t- now like to get comfortable with it? How, how do you sort of approach it? Surely, we, surely a couple of dozen bottles of the uh, <laughs> of the uh, of the target's uh, latest vintage is what you need to do, Catherine. Yeah, a bit more penfold. <laughs> uh, no, uh, you go back, to, of course, to first principles and have a look at the trajectory of the earnings over the next few years. Now, hopefully, if we can get Australian Chinese government relations settling down uh, and we can get that wine market opening up, that's very profitable for penfolds mm-hmm. if that occurs, and it also um, you know adds another pricing lead for uh, penfolds. So we still think that that is enough for us to be remain uh, interested in owning the stock from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, one, before we have a look ahead to next year, Catherine, mm. markets are always teaching us something. Um, what, what have you learnt th- this year that surprised you? Or what's the new lesson you've learned as we've gone through 2023? I think there's a real change in the market. I think in terms of people's focus, move away from PE, Mm -hmm. The US market has gone to free cash flow. Uh, I think in Australia, we're moving that way as well. Uh, So just to explain there, moving away from focusing on price to earnings multiples and focusing more on the the, cash flow that companies um, throwing off. Yeah, exactly. Why is that so? It's because the capital intensity of businesses is changing, Mm -hmm. particularly if you're a more technology-based company or services-based. You have less less capex, and so therefore generally you're throwing off more free cash flow. Mm. But it is also because what we're seeing, tricky accounting from companies, uh, is they're putting more of their costs into the capex line. So they're allowing people... People say, oh, don't worry, our PE is pretty low. And then you actually go and look at the free cash that the business is generating after CapEx. Yes. And we're seeing, oh, it's not as quite as good as you are telling us. Yeah, right. Or they're capitalising their costs in the, in the CapEx line as well. So it's interesting. The US has really moved that way. And I think Australian market will move that way as well. So it's the old, uh, a new lesson's the old lesson, cash is the king. Cash is the king. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Catherine, let's look ahead to 2024. Mm. What are the indicators you're watching and themes you're thinking about? 
Well, in a, AI was something we haven't actually talked about, and that's actually been a massive yeah. change this year, right, in 23. And so as we go forward, continue to monitor what's going on there. Um, macro, obviously, is going to continue to dominate. Um, and here in Australia, uh, it's when does the Reserve Bank cut, right? And most forecasters are saying in the back end of the year. Yep. Incredibly important because if you look at the household right now, they're struggling. One of the things... Uh, is the income tax uh, that households are paying, it's at a record high. You know, it's 19%. So I think we deserve the stage three tax cuts. <laughs> <laughs> that is something that they should come through and it needs to come through. And what is interesting also, I think, is on the labour market in terms of companies and what they're actually doing. Yep. They're actually not shedding labour at the moment. They're still sitting on labour. Mm. But watch what they're doing in hours the hours that they're um, playing, because that's already fallen 2%. And when we get in sort of recessionary times, that's down, usually falls about 6%. So they're already cutting back on workers' hours. And that's because they're trying to manage their margins, which obviously are under pressure. So if you're advising Michelle Bullock, Catherine, <laughs> oh, <laughs> we're all, we're all advising me. her on the, uh, on the Chanticleer podcast, but um, <laughs> uh, do, do, do you reckon recession is is – Ahead for Australia, or is it something you know we can we can stop short of that? Yeah, I mean we ha we haven't had the bad times, real bad times yet, right? Mm. So what they're going to try and do is manage a slowdown and hope it doesn't become a downturn, right? Yep. So and what is really important is obviously things like the iron ore price, obviously another in the one thirties now, very uh, positive for the Australian economy when holding it up well. Um, but also, equally, the household sector is struggling and now they're going to cut back migration. That's the one thing that's hold, held up our economy in the last 12 months has been that record migration coming into the country. So as that slows, you know, yes, yeah. please, we need some rate cuts. And I think if you annualise inflation now in the last three months, it's in the th high threes. Yep. So it is coming down. Um, it's just a bit sticky in terms of the wages. That's the biggest issue, I think. Mm. All right. So the household's struggling. What does that? What's that going to mean for corporate profits mm. or free cash flows and margins? <laughs> yes, <good point>. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the February reporting season is going to be tough uh, in terms of what people are reporting. Obviously, they're particularly if they're just domestically exposed. Yeah. They don't have any sort of growth angle. You know, they've just had to bank pretty much a five, four to six percent wage increase coming through. So that's hard. And, you know, wage increases lag price increases. So they all put prices up, you know, 12, 18 months ago and they all great, had great profits. Yep. And now, the, the, you know, reality is hitting where the costs are increasing and then they can't keep increasing their prices. So we're going to have a bit of margin squeeze going on. Uh, and then it's what, what's interesting is there's the good companies and there's the not so good companies. And what in the last reporting season, what we saw was people weren't managing their balance sheets very well. And so we saw these, you know, unhedged uh, debt positions where, you know, interest rate costs suddenly mm. hit the P&L and, you know, that was pretty disappointing. Um, I think we'll continue to see CapEx rising because there's still, particularly in mining companies, there's still a lot of projects to be finishing. Yep. Same on the infrastructure transport companies. Um, but it's still, it's still going to be tough in February. So I think, you know, we could be in for, we're obviously in for a bit of a Santa Christmas rally um, currently, and then we'll get a reality check in February. Oh, great. <laughs> um, so you mentioned some of the big macro issues. You know, we started 2023 thinking about China and US recession. How do those play into your thinking when you think about the local market? I mean, we've got eight big global elections next year, finishing with po the possible return of Donald Trump next November. I mean, in some ways, if you think about those elections, they could all be disruptive in some way, but they could all be really stimulatory to your point about, you know, Elections tend to be come with big spending promises. Mm. Um, are you are you worried about that stuff as it relates to Australia, or are you just watching that as a general indicator of sentiment? Uh, well, the geopolitical is obviously. I mean, I, the interesting thing is it's not as important to the market as we sort of make out. But yep. Trump's return may be, you know, a major shift again, particularly in terms of geopolitics. Um, I think one of the th interesting things as we go into twenty four is the fact that China. The investors' sentiment towards China is so bearish, mm. right? Uh, and so one wonders if, the, you know, the government was to do more, <laughs> that it could, you know, positively stimulate the economy, which mm. would be really important for Australia. So we're spending a bit of time trying to get on a, more of an understanding 
around China because the Politburo will come out in February, you know, with their GDP, um, you know, target for the year, yes. which we can all bank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if it is slightly more positive than the market is expecting, you know, say it's a five rather than a four or something, then it's be interesting how that plays out. Um, and so we are spending quite a bit of time on that and the impact that that will have more mm. in, in terms of Australia. So what does that mean as to how you're thinking about the market? Like what's, what sectors do you like in Australia going into 2024 and which ones do you not like? Right. Okay. In terms of sectors that we like, like healthcare, like in terms of our investment process, we look for quality growth at a reasonable price companies, right? So healthcare is an area that we've always been invested in. This year, we've done really well out of Cochlear, not so well out of ResMed and CSL, but we haven't lost faith in CSL and ResMed. Uh, CSL in particular, we think they've got a really important announcement in the first quarter with regards to their heart uh, drug, the 112 coming out. And I think that could be a real pivotal turning point if mm. if that comes to fruition. So that's really important. So healthcare is a sector that we're really you know, quite mm. large in. Um, conversely, we've actually been, you know, sort of increasing our position in rates, um, not so much the sort of... Oof. No, the Goodmans of this world, <laughs> okay. but, you know, Charter Hall, okay. you know, th- those sectors have been really underplayed. So um, there are real estate investment trusts, which which we've talked about in the podcast before as being trading at very big discounts to what mm. their assets are worth, but mm. you're, you're waiting more, in selectively. We're more the fund management end of okay. that. We won't just buy a pure rent collector. Yep. Um, but we think that, you know, there are some sort of promising signs there. So we've um, increased our weight in the real estate sector as well. Mm. Um, conversely, outside of, you know, Santos, we don't have a very big position in energy. So that's um, a sector that really, you know, resources always, resources share prices always follow the commodity price. You know, we've had another lesson with that with lithium yep. um, and the lithium share prices. We think the lithium sector's, you know, oversold. Um, and so eventually, you know, as we go through this whole decarbonisation energy transition and we all move into electric vehicles eventually, you know, Australia is in a good place in terms of its lithium positions. And so we've just picked the best in class, the lowest cost, the great balance sheet companies. And, you know, Pilbara is one that stands out there for us. Mm, Pilbara what, Minerals. What about the banks just as a bucket? Are you sort of <sighs> overweight or no, underweight? No, no, no. Um, well and truly underweight. Um, no, the bank, the banks are sort of, you know, hurting themselves at the moment. Uh, it would be good to see them, you know, focused more on returns as opposed to, you know, mar- cutting margins and cutting each other. Um, what I found interesting for, you know, your listeners out there, they're probably hurting, of course, with the rate increases that we've seen. But of that 425 basis points that the Reserve Bank has put through, the banks have only actually put through 365 yeah. on mortgages. So... You know, it's actually interesting just how much they've absorbed um, from a margin perspective um, and their institutional businesses have done really well. So they've sort of offset that. Um, but overall, the banking sector, it, it, it's very well priced. I mean, it's fully valued as far as we're concerned. Can I just go back to healthcare? Because we talked about AI as one of mm. the big themes mm. and you mentioned ResMed as one of a, a company that's had a tough year, mm. all because of the rise of Azempic and mm. other drugs. Mm. Um, there was a study that showed uh, Azempic could help reduce uh, the diagnosis of sleep apnea, mm. maybe, possibly. Uh, it wasn't definitive. It was you know a bit of research. Mm. Um, how have you seen this Azempic wave play through the market? Like it's... A bit like AI, it's it, it's become this sort of snowball effect where it takes everything out in its path. Yeah, exactly. And some everyone's got a friend who's tried it or <laughs> using it, and then you've obviously got the side effects from using that drug. Mm. Look, we're in the early stages of that drug, and it clearly does work, um, and it works for a lot of people. And it will go from an injection form to a tablet form yep. at some point over the next few years, and that will result in you know another higher usage of those drugs. I mean, personally, I think anything that's beneficial for you know, the fact that we're all getting older and we're all getting fatter, that, that you know, that can help people's lives extend. I think that's fantastic. Mm. Um, but I think at the end of the day, for something like ResMed, uh, you do need to use those products in conjunction with your sleep apnea machines. So I, I think there's still a place for ResMed and I still think it's a you know really good, strong company. Yeah, fair enough. Catherine, is there any uh, unloved gems or... Uh Quiet achievers that you're that, that that you think our our listeners should keep an eye on heading into the new year. Um, 
Well, we like, com- you know, we're, we're like, as I said, quality growth at a reasonable price. There's a few stocks that haven't done particularly well this year, which, I mean, I'm mean, named in terms of Macquarie was one, Charter Hall was another one uh, for going into next year. We still, obviously, like I said, like the healthcare, the CSL and the ResMeds from that perspective. Um, they're just, you know, some names that I'd throw out there. Yeah, very nice. Well, Catherine, we love questions here at the uh, Chanticleer podcast. And this week, our question is from Tony from Sydney. If you've got a question you want to send in, you can email us at chanticleer at afr.com. And you can also send us a question in audio form. Just record a voice memo on your phone, include your name and where you're from, and email it to us. So Tony asks, is there a finance-related book or item at the top of your Christmas wish list? Anthony, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first, and it's a little bit embarrassing, and I know I'm five years late, but <laughs> I really got my head, got to get my head around Bitcoin, mm. cryptocurrencies. So there's a book out there called The Basics in Bitcoin and Blockchains by Anthony Lewis that's supposed to be really good at explaining it, because I've come to realize it's probably not going away. No, and there's a 30,000-word Matt Levine, uh, the guy from Bloomberg, awesome columnist from Bloomberg, he wrote a 30,000-word essay on it too. So I can lend you that and you can go oh, through thanks. that if you really, <laughs> really want to get deep. Catherine, anything uh, on your list? Yeah, well, my husband has just read, so I'm going to read it. Uh, Neil Howes, um, The Fourth Turning is Here. Ooh. Yeah, it's a very interesting book about, obviously, the differences in generations in terms of what we want, but it goes through history and looks at turning points. Okay. Uh, and so I think given Trump election in November, it's sort of predicting that he probably could get back in. Uh, just It's just an interesting book from that perspective, I think. That sounds good. Well, my my uh, on top of my list is Going Infinite, The Rise and Fall of a New Tycoon, which is Michael Lewis's book about Sam Bankman-Fried. Oh. I love Michael Lewis, and uh, I reckon it'll be great read oh, yeah. if, if, if anything else. So I think in honour of Charlie Munger, we should be reading some of his books this year too. We probably should. <laughs> I do feel as though I've read every uh, quote that Charlie Munger ever provided <laughs> in the last few weeks, but you're right. There's some timeless stuff. Don't <laughs> well, Catherine, we were right. You, we did save the best guest till last. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you, and um, we uh, wish you a, a, a great and your family a, a fantastic summer break. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me, James. All the best. And Anthony, thanks to you too for another great year. It's been uh, really enjoyable. Absolutely, James, and let's do it all again next year. Yes, and finally, uh, thanks to all our Chanticleer podcast listeners for their support throughout the year. It's a highlight of the week recording this for Anthony and I, and we've been thrilled and surprised with the feedback that we've received from many listeners. So we wish you all a great break, and we look forward to returning on February 2. Before we go, we've got to say a special thank you to the people behind the scenes who make this all work each and every week. Alex Gow and Lap Fan are our brilliant producers. It doesn't happen without them, so thanks to Alex and Lap as well. Merry Christmas, everyone. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! If you like the podcast and you want to know more, consider sharing or giving the podcast a review as it helps other listeners find us. And don't forget to follow wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business, and power. For more, go to AFR.com and you can subscribe to The Financial Review, the daily habit of successful people at AFR.com slash subscribe. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson, and Anthony McDonald, with special guest Catherine Alfrey. And it was produced by Alex Gow and Lap Fan. Our theme is by Alex Gow. The executive producer is Fiona Buffini. The Australian Financial Review.